Compass Mining makes Bitcoin mining accessible to everyone. Start mining in as little as 48 hours with our turnkey hardware online and mining directly to your Bitcoin wallet within two business days. Find out more at compassmining.io and get started now. Hey miners, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's episode, Anthony Power and I are pleased to welcome Shannon Squires. He's the CMO or Chief Mining Officer at Compass Mining. We've got a lot to talk about in today's video, but before we do, please take a second, hit the like button, you guys. It's a big help to myself and the channel. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. And let us know in the comments section below if you've used any of Compass's services before, your outlook on their business, and your thoughts on Bitcoin price heading into the final few months of 2024. Now, with that being said, let's get into today's interview. Okay, guys, so that's right. Today's video, a special guest, the first time on the program, we've got the CMO or Chief Mining Officer of Compass Mining, Shannon Squires, here joining us on the program. Compass, obviously a supporter of the channel, a very interesting business model, allowing people, uh, retail individuals, to get involved in Bitcoin mining for themselves. So, Shannon, excited to learn more about this company, yourself, and your story surrounding Bitcoin. Hey, thank you guys for having me on. Excited to be on the podcast. Hopefully we can uh, go through and answer any questions and you know walk through what Compass is today versus what it used to be within the hardware and hosting space. Yeah, sounds good. We've got a, a nice little list of questions for you here. So to kick things off, Shannon, because this is your first time on the program, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and your uh, orange pill moment, so to speak? My orange pill moment. Yeah, well, I've been in the space since about 2017. Sometime in 2017, uh, I first heard about Bitcoin. Uh, back then, I was in the exercise physiology world. I was doing research for their uh, at CU Anschutz and running their human performance lab or running my own business. Uh, I just have an interesting background of being a nerd and you know, dealing with the energy world from where I grew up, uh, learned about Bitcoin through a client who was in the banking industry, asked me about it. To me, I'm like, oh, that's video game money. Very similar story to a lot of people in early 2017. Did my homework, found out it was a video game money. And I think within three weeks, I had a bunch of GPUs running in my crawl space, uh, my wife yelling at me for the noise and everything else. So got into it pretty quick, realized mining was the where I wanted to be. I was a little misled in the beginning, you know, mining various altcoins, things like that. Had my you know journey throughout 2017 and decided to dive headfirst into Bitcoin mining. So left a previous industry with a very good career of 15 years to jump headfirst into Bitcoin mining. Um, worked a few different places within the space. A lot of the, you know, self stuff from like brokering sites to brokering hosting to brokering hardware. Uh, worked for a couple of notable public companies within the industry as well from a consulting basis, and then eventually joined Compass about two years ago. Uh, joined Compass mostly on the procurement side, so both site procurement, whether that's a hosting facility, greenfield, or hardware procurement, infrastructure procurement as well. Uh, that moved over into the operations space and eventually into my current position as the chief mining officer with Compass. So with Compass, um, obviously everybody's seen their, you know, we're a four-year-old company now. They've probably hit every pit hole along the way when dealing within this space. And so they've, they've learned a lot and been able to survive through it from, you know, dealing with hosting in foreign countries to putting down our own sites, to building our own operations team, to operating third-party sites. Um, and then how to really take care of that retail client. So we're one of the last standing and I think largest, uh, entity that still hosts, you know, minimum order quantity, one miners. Um, there's a couple others out there that do it very well, you know, a little bit smaller entities. Um, and then there's a lot of bigger hosting companies, but generally they're looking at, you know, 10 megawatt contracts and things like that. So we we operate in this space where we take care of very large uh, enterprise level clients at the same time as taking care of retail and trying to provide a level of service in which we understand that that retail miner is, that's a hundred percent of their investment. That's everything that one miner. So it's the same as a, a thousand miners with a large entity uh, being down at the same time. So we take that approach from customer service and then have really focused this last year in trying to aggregate our third-party uh, partners 
into just the best in the industry and then moving more full stack as we can. So our big focus has been on, you know, site acquisition and procurement after we've already built out our in-house operating that, you know, started operating for other third parties as well. So I think that's a little bit of a background from where I started. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of self-education in Bitcoin mining, especially if you got in in 2017 or earlier, you got to go figure it out on your own. There's no guidebooks. I think we've produced guidebooks and a lot of people have them now, but back then there was a lot of self-education on the energy industry, on land acquisition procurement, and then also just how to run these miners at scale. That's uh, that's some introduction. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so... I didn't know how far to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the introduction I would have put. I would have come across as well. <laughs> I was going to say. But, uh, in t- you've already answered like the first three questions, but but let's let's look into the sort of services that uh, Compass Money offer. You've mentioned a couple of them already in that introduction there, but sort of give us a sort of like a a, a little bit more meat on the bones with some of these services that you do provide at the moment. Yeah, so I guess it's good to kind of start with where Compass started. So Compass started very much as an aggregator of hosting services. So being able to go contract very large amounts of capacity and then aggregate people that wouldn't otherwise benefit from those lower utility rates uh, into those services. So very much an aggregator of hosting capacity. Uh, From there, you know, they continue to grow very rapidly. I think they, you know... When I joined the company and we finally finalized a few energizations, I think we got over 160 megawatts of capacity online at our peak. Um, and so as far as the services, we started out as just offering hosting services. Um, it's kind of a very much a buy and host model. So here's a bunch of miners that are available. If you buy them, we'll put them in this facility. At the same time, uh, capacity was kind of tight. So we also did a very large amount of just hardware only sales. So, hey, here's miners that are available, selling them to people who want to go run them at home or put them in their own mining farms. Um, That progressed. And then we started doing a bit of hosting only. So people who had purchased large quantities of miners from Bitmain or whoever and somewhere else didn't have a home for them. So we would go put together facilities one way or another in order to be able to host their miners. So that's most of the hosting products encompass around buy and host, a you know hosting only or just hardware sales um that progressed to one of the products you see today which is our turnkey hosting sales so we have miners that are live in a mining farm so you guys can purchase that miner and be able to flip it over uh the marketplace is another feature that falls in with hosting in which anybody in our ecosystem can list their own miners for sale in the marketplace with the hosting contract so uh, that's been you know, a great experience for a lot of people, and there's not a lot of avenues to offload hardware if they want to come in and out of the space outside of the marketplace or much larger, more cumbersome contracts. Um, then the services have expanded. So as Compass dealt with various issues within the industry, whether that's you know siting you know, power acquisition or getting infrastructure like containers or switchgear transformers, or just logistics. How do we get miners out of Malaysia and China or into Canada or out, you know, from Canada to the US and whatnot? So we end up building our own logistics services. We run a logistics company now, uh, provide those services to anybody who needs them. Um, we do siting for other people. So as far as looking for greenfield projects or keeping a, a list and a record of sites that are out there on the market for sale in which people might be interested in turnkey sites that are ready built. And then the last one is our, you know, our accelerated by compass program in which we take all of our managed services, such as finding a site for a client, taking them through the process of getting their electrical service agreement, getting their land acquired, getting their permitting done, getting the site built, and then ultimately operating the site. Um, So we provide site operations, both for our accelerated clients and for any third parties that are interested in it um, at any scale they want. So whether that's just remote operations um, or they want, you know, 24 seven boots on the ground staff providing the highest uptime possible, you know, we meet those needs as well. So that's kind of services. Yeah. It's It's kind of pretty broad. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, so it was interesting that you said that if, if say for instance, me as a retail investor, I went to Bitmain and bought or maybe through intermediary bought say five, ST twenty ones or something like that. I could then approach you guys and say, "I've got these machines, need somewhere to host them because where I've got them at the moment, the energy price is is too high, and therefore I'm looking for a a, a better deal somewhere else." Is that is that that that's part of what I could do um, as opposed to even like going to you guys if I want to and buy miners off your database effectively. 
Yeah, so that's just the hosting only services. We do provide that. Obviously, uh, hosting capacity or just you know Bitcoin mining data center capacity is always at a constraint, and so there's always going to be a favor towards current clients and people that are doing buy and host over people bringing their own miners. So if we're limited on capacity, you know you might have to wait till the next farm opens up. But if we have extra space, then it's completely acceptable. Yeah, and Shannon. Um, what- yeah, sorry. Yeah, oh, just one from my side here, Shannon. I'm curious on the the software and the pool side of things for retail investors who are watching who maybe don't have a deep understanding of minor settings and software and pool operation and things like that. If they want to start mining on their own, how does how does the back end support work? Yeah, so um, like we don't operate a pool today, and I think it's something that's been important in Compass's ethos over time is we're kind of pool agnostic. So Anybody comes into Compass, they get to pick their stratum and tell us what it is and what pool they want run on their miner. So we want this to be, we want to give them as much power to mine on their miner as if they're running it themselves. And so it doesn't matter if they want to run on Brains or F2 pool or Luxos or, you know, whatever pool suits their fancy. We're going to let them set that up. Uh, We have, uh, you know, within their dashboard, they can go request a pool change. Um, and there's so many hours in which we do that. Part of that is just for safety concerns. We don't want uh, someone's account to request a pool change and change it immediately and find out it was a fraudulent request. Someone got into their email, you know, got their account access. So there's some delays in that on purpose. Uh, we try to put in as many safety precautions as we can. Makes sense. And for people who are brand new to the space, if they don't want to deal with that technical side of things uh, uh do you offer a, a managed service where you take care of the settings the the energy rates all that kind of stuff yeah as far as the hosting that's a full-in white glove managed service so it comes at a fixed price fixed monthly price per miner um so they see that whether they're purchasing from the website or if it's a you know if they're dealing with an account manager or someone on the sales team they're going to be able to give them custom offers for that so they'll have a fixed monthly price you know, per miner that they're hosting based on where it's being placed in a facility and what the moder- uh, model is. And we handle everything. Um, so the, they have the ability to go change stuff themselves, some features like pool changes. But for the most part, you know, if they have anything that they need an issue with, they just reach out to the customer service team. Our ticket response time has dropped uh, to, you know, they get a response in less than 24 hours from all the tickets. Our satisfaction rating and customer service is uh, recently exceeded 80%, which is, you know, pretty amazing um, from that standpoint. So it's it's been a long road coming. we got a pretty robust customer service team. I mean, Compass grew from, you know, a few employees kicking this off to over 140 today. And the majority of those employees are focused around providing service for our clients. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned about uh, doing even, you know, like looking for sites and actually building sites for clients. Um, how are you finding the ability to source these sites in the in the current uh, climate with like um, the advent of HPC looking for every available amount of spare capacity? Um, is it, are you finding it a challenge or are you still finding plenty of opportunities out there? I mean, there's plenty of opportunities out there. It's just a different lead time than what it used to be. So generally speaking, Bitcoin mining has a different load profile than a traditional data center. Or, you know, an AI facility, HP, that's traditional data center, tier one through four, you know, well, how much redundancy do you want? Uh, the biggest difference is that a data center, you know, all the workloads that we I see today from AI, ML, all that stuff, they don't want to be shut off. They want to run 24-7, 365. They want five nines of uptime. Well, that's a different utility contract um, than what we're looking for. Bitcoin is, you know, a decentralized network, right? So it's spread out all over the world. If one mining farm goes down or even an entire country of mining farm goes down, Bitcoin keeps, you know, tick tock next block. So from our standpoint, we're trying to optimize for energy utilization. Where can we go that there's excess wasted energy? We find a lot of excess wasted energy happens to be around renewable farms. So wind overproducing when no one's consuming, solar overproducing when no one's consuming. Um, and if you've seen a lot of the Bitcoin mining council, you know, Michael Saylor stuff, you guys can see that, you know, Bitcoin is the most renewable based industry there is, um, you know, it's over 60%. It's pretty crazy. And it's just because those, uh, energy assets are, uh, intermittent in their production. Bitcoin models that if the, if there's power available, we can consume it. And if it's not, we can shut off 
So that way that energy is not just being, you know, curtailed or run to ground or something like that. Uh, it gets a good use case. And we've seen this be super helpful in various markets, such as ERCOT, MISO, PJM, and helping to balance load within. So if load gets too high, prices go up. Bitcoin miners are extremely price sensitive. We're going to shut off from curtail before it ever gets to an emergency level just because, you know, the prices start getting absorbent. Um, so it's kind of a fun, it's a fun energy arbitrage in a way of speaking, but uh, finding sites are pretty easy. It just depends on scale, right? So if you're looking for 10 to 15 megawatts, you can find, you know, substation and capacity at the distribution level that's available. Uh, we just have to cite it. Like, what state do you want to be in? Why do you want to be there? Do you want to go after the lowest cost power? Or do you want to go after something, you know, that's more middle of the range? Once you've identified that, then you can go. If you're looking for a bigger site, you know, 30 plus megawatts, you're probably going to end up on transmission level. That's going to require you to bring a substation. So these are longer lead time projects. And when you look at traditional data centers, that's all they're looking at, right? They're not looking at, hey, can I get a site up in 30 to 90 days? <laughs> like Bitcoin miners are crazy. They run stupid fast. Utilities look at us like we're nuts. Um, and data centers are coming like, hey, I want 200 megawatts. And they understand it's going to be a 24 to 36 month process to get that 200 megawatts. Compass Mining is your trusted partner in Bitcoin mining. Whether you're investing in one machine or thousands, our customizable solutions are tailored to meet your needs. We are your experts in Bitcoin mining, offering a platform where individuals and businesses can purchase hardware, host machines, and access a range of ancillary Bitcoin mining services. We also specialize in large-scale site development and data center operations. Discover more at compassmining.io and see how we can power your success today. In terms of, because um, you've got obviously got a, a lot of different sites, do you, do you have repair sites at most of your facilities? So right now we have, I think, 21 independent facilities between the U.S. and Canada. Um, we run a spoken hub model. So actually our repair facility is based out of Denver. Um, we just moved from two smaller warehouses to keeping those and adding another 45,000 square foot uh, service center in which we can do everything from Want, it acts as the logistics hub for us. It acts as, you know, we have hashboard repair there, bolt on, cleaning, everything. Like if you if there's a service you need, we got it. It's if it, heading back in the summer months. You guys want us to clean all your miners, pull all the heat sinks off, put new thermal paste on them, get them ready for summer. You know, we can action all of that out of Denver. Uh, it worked out for Denver just because it's such a central location. Dealing with mining farms that are everywhere from Washington State to New York and in Ontario all the way to Texas and everything in between. So that central location was pretty pivotal into being able to service everybody cost effectively. It started out internal. It was, hey, we had a bunch of repairs. There weren't a lot of repair shops. There weren't a lot of trained individuals. So we focused on self first and, you know, we built our in-house repair facilities and scaled them up, got people trained. We continue to scale and broaden and advance those services so we can provide them to other people. Um, I don't think we've publicly announced that we do a lot of third-party repair services, but it's completely available uh, just like the logistics. Yeah. And and in terms of turnaround, because if you've got one hub for repairs and you've got 21 facilities all over North America, what do, do you sort of like um, set your own self standards of, of getting the machine back in back in situ and, and, and earning um, revenues for the individual? Yeah, generally speaking, we're, you know, depending on how many miners we're dealing with and where they're coming from, you're probably looking at like a two week turnaround, depending on that volume. So realize that, okay, you're going to spend a couple days dealing with troubleshooting, right? So everything we can to fix the miner on site, if it's a power supply or a control board or a fan, like we give all of our you know retail clients, they'll get free fans, right? We just fix them and get them running. Um, then we have, you know, control boards and power supplies on site. We just need client approval because it's their hardware. They own it. If they want to send it somewhere else to get fixed, they're more than welcome to take possession of it and do that. Um, so generally it's faster, more cost effective for us just to fix it on site. So we'll do all the bolt-ons on site at every facility. Um, yeah. and then the only things that really get sent to Denver are hashboard repairs. Yeah. And, you know, we'll quote our clients say, Hey, we think it's going to be this. They'll agree. We'll send it to Denver. That's that kind of two week turnaround that we're looking for. Yeah. Cause it's usually, yeah, it's not, it's not cost effective to ship these things overnight. Um, so it's usually, you know, a handful of days shipping gets received, gets cleaned, tested, diagnosed, repaired, 
retested, gone through an aging test and with a curtailment in there to make sure these miners aren't going to fail when they get back to site, rebox, repackaged, shipped to the site, redeployed, re-networked, you know, all that fun stuff. So that's what we shoot for. Obviously in the summertime, that's probably when it's the roughest, just there's a, you know, if you have a bunch of miners in hot climates that are just working hard and aging population, like the J pros, you're going to see more repairs. And so newer miners, less repairs, older miners, more repairs. Uh, so volume ebbs and flows. Um, I think we're processing or have the capability of processing like a thousand, you know, repairs a week through our service center in Denver. So we're servicing 21 facilities, you know, 60,000 miners. That's, you know, decent enough. It's working right now. At my age, I'm feeling like an S17 at the moment. I need more repairs. <laughs> We're going to have to yeah. send you <laughs> off for a repair, Anthony. Um, very <laughs> cool. And I'm glad you differentiated, Anthony, the fan repairs on site versus the hashboards because you and I, I know you were thinking about core scientific, core how many scientific. fans. Yeah. Exactly. See, we hang out too much, Shannon. This is this is what happens. Um, next question. You talk about these facilities, these various different facilities. I just saw you guys put out a press release in relation uh, to Nebraska. So I was curious if you could give us an update there and kind of uh, your portfolio, maybe next steps from there. Yeah. So we just energized uh, seven and a half megawatts in Nebraska. So always exciting to expand. Um, Nebraska is a great state as far as the climate goes. Uh, we've had uh, previous facilities in Nebraska that had pretty decent uptime. So uh, we're happy to continue expanding there. Um as far as like future expansion, you know, there's always more in the works, more is more is power available. The biggest issue with telling people, hey, I'm going to do another 15 or 30 megawatts is the time frames. There's so many things that can set these sites back. And I've never seen a site just pop up and energize the day it's supposed to. So whether that's land zoning or permitting or inspections or, you know, you order something and there's a labor strike at the ports and so you can't get a transformer where you need it to be in time. Um, like there's always something that's going to delay it or change it or modify it. And this is just a constant battle within this space. Um, and so for us, like, Hey, we want to grow. We want to expand. If I can get another 30 megawatts online by the end of the year between, you know, we're probably looking in like Nebraska and Iowa, you know, where we already have existing facilities, looking in Ohio, where we have existing facilities, which one's going to happen next? I, you know, it all depends on too many factors. But I, I think my goal is to have about another 30 megawatts online by the end of the year uh, and then just keep growing into next year. Compass kind of, they grew very rapidly early on and we're taking a much more measured approach of controlled growth so that we don't have as many bad customer service experiences. Obviously, there's always going to be things outside of our control, but taking a more measured approach to growth has been beneficial there. That's good. In terms of um, uh, business models, um, I mean, the hope when I came into space just over four years ago, many of the North American miners were actually hosting as well as self mining. So even like the DMGs, DigiHost, Bit Farms, Hut8, Hive Digital, they all had a hosting business as well as a self mining business. But we've seen a lot of those drop off, and yet. Um, there are some still some obviously Marathon still have a, a, a major part of their fleet um, hosted, and the likes of Bitdeer. Do you do you see because I mean, having spoke to Bitdeer, they say it's, it can be quite a profitable market in the bear cycle. Do you see that that you know some of these miners might start thinking about reintroducing that or or the reverse question is do you see Compass um, maybe moving into self mining in the future? Uh, so there's there's kind of a lot to dig in. Like I said, I've been in this space since 2017. So I've seen every aspect of this, not just from the Compass perspective, right? So there's sometimes you have short hosting agreements and that allows a company to spin up a facility, get some revenue generated, save up some money, purchase their own miners, and they want to move out that client to put in their own miners. It's a very straightforward business plan. We've seen that happen over and over again uh, across multiple companies. We've seen the model like, you know, Marathon was very public about their model being, you know, super capital light, right? They hosted everywhere. Asset and then light. they, yeah, <laughs> as, sorry, capital, not like asset light. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, pivoting that to, you know, buying multiple facilities over the last, you know, year or so. So we've seen other companies that took the opposite approach, right? So Iris, now Irene, they, you know, very like, hey, we're going to buy and own as much of the power infrastructure as we can or own the buildings. 
they took a different approach um, and, you know, they've been marching down that and then adding in AI as they go down that path. So we've seen a lot of these models. We've seen, you know, the self-mining plus hosting models. Um, and I don't know which one's going to be best. I am always a fan of diversifying business incentives. For Compass, we're focused on serving the client. We think that if we do too much self-mining, that we don't want to be in competition with our clients for this capacity that we have. Capacity during bull runs is always limited. And if we're in competition with our client, that's not going to be the best for them. So for us, any self-mining that we're doing is mostly focused on having uh, units available that if a client is experiencing a prolonged redeployment or a prolonged repair, we can kick it over as a temporary unit. So that client can, you know, see their revenue as they move forward as far as Bitcoin coming in from mining and have less interruption of their service. So that's from a self-mining perspective, that's Compass is ethos today. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon is, you know, very much focused on the client. So it's, yeah. So what I see is it's, it's, it's the flexibility where you have, uh, capacity available for people to come and purchase whilst it's still available you're self-mining that capacity because you want to get a return on the actual the physical miner while you're waiting for the for the customer to come in yeah or at the same time it's just those miners that are running for compass are temporary units for people dealing with like we just did some very large relocations yeah. so having a fleet of miners that allow us to give them temp units while we, we relocate is a good you know customer service sure. policy excellent yeah, very cool. I'm learning so much in this. Now, my next question for you, Shannon, you said you've been in the industry for quite some time. You've seen a number of different angles involved with different companies and aspects of the, the sector. Can you give us your uh, current outlook or sentiment at a macro level on Bitcoin? Um, any potential catalysts? We've got the election cycle coming up. We've got having this year. How are you feeling uh, from, I guess, the helicopter view right now in terms of Bitcoin overall? As far as Bitcoin itself, like I tried to guess when the price is going to go up and go down and it didn't serve me well. Um, I played those games and then just now I just, you know, I lost all my Bitcoin in a boating accident like everybody else. And, you know, it, it stays there. So uh, as far as price goes, like I think it's kind of inevitable that the Bitcoin price just climbs because it's a fixed asset. There's never going to be more than 21 million. I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, you know, Sailor's prediction sounds good. He might be a little bearish and that what does he say, 13 million a coin or something like that. Um, <laughs> the question is when, I don't know when. Uh, if I knew when, I probably wouldn't have to work anymore as far as that goes. So, but in general, the, you know, price is, price is going to do a difficulty does and that goes up and to the right. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, there's going to be times in which it goes down. I don't know when that happens. This is, you know, I've been doing this for a little while. So this isn't my first bear market and uh, the next bull run won't be my first. Uh, for us, it's about mitigating risk as a company. So you know, what do we do to make sure that we don't end up going out of business or bankrupt as a lot of other Bitcoin companies have in the past when they're dealing with these, uh, you know, bear markets. So they get hit pretty hard. And so making sure that companies aren't over leveraged and things like that are obviously super important, making sure they're controlling their power risks. Uh, you know, obviously no one predicted a Ukraine war, but you know, that drew surge natural gas prices and hurt a lot of Bitcoin miners and other companies in general. So I would say like, I'm always bullish uh, at the same time on the person who wants Bitcoin price to tank. Like if it could drop to like 12K, Bitcoin miners can be super cheap. Um, that'd be great for everybody. Everybody could pick up some S21s at a really good price. Um, so it's always kind of a weird world for me, wanting Bitcoin to go down to make mining cheaper, but at the same time, wanting to go up as a, you know, a Bitcoin holder. So it's kind of a weird world there. It is interesting right now. This is something that uh, is new to this cycle that I've seen. So normally when Bitcoin is in a bear market and mining is in a bear market, like right now, mining economics are not great. Uh, last week or two ago when Bitcoin was below 60K, didn't look super fun to be a Bitcoin miner. Um, obviously recent you know, price spike, everybody starts to get a little excited. Hey, is it going to 100K? What's happening? But ultimately what's we've been sitting here in this kind of bear market for Bitcoin mining, but site acquisition and procurement has been going crazy. I mean, I'm sure you guys have looked at the publicly listed prices from acquisitions by clean spark and riot and some others and i'm like man these sites the value of the sites continues to increase and I, i'm like that's in a bull run right now right that's just going crazy and i don't know if that's driven like you said by ai or if it's just driven by you know large pubcos wanting more demand i i don't know but that side of things is definitely in a bull run 
while mining is kind of in this like you know low Con- side conversations of- <laughs> definitely about um hpc from a from a power perspective that's why the miners are, are certainly those that haven't are starting to pivot across to that already um in terms of you've mentioned about facilities across north america is compass mining keeping abreast of um potential opportunities outside of those jurisdictions or do you think you'll stay just north america focused um Bear in mind, we've seen miners pivot to Paraguay, Argentina, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, Middle East, places that you would not normally expect Bitcoin mines to be done. But um, is that something that's you know maybe on the on part of your strategy to to think outside the outside the box as potential sites? Yeah, we we always are privy to opportunities outside of the U.S. and Canada. Um, obviously, every country has its own challenges. Uh, we are more cautious than I think we used to yeah. be. Just, you know, you look at Compass's history outside of the U.S., we've had some, you know, black eyes. So we, we're a bit more cautious. And if you just look in the industry in general, right? So, you know, Russia, war, bad. Uh, Kazakhstan, you know, kicked all the miners out, you know, shut no off power, power. No power. <laughs> all that fun stuff. Yeah, it had to get a license. Not many people can get it. All that, you know, the country of Georgia, they basically increased power rates until it wasn't economical and they left. Paraguay, it looked like people were either stealing power or something was going on down there. Government shut it off, kicked out a bunch of people, shut that down. If you were one of the guys who tried to figure out how to get into Venezuela with the lovely government subsidized power, sometimes your miners just disappeared. Um Canada, you know, obviously you see moratoriums in Manitoba. Like we had, uh, you know, nine facilities in Manitoba up there and that we can't build anymore because of the moratorium that's going on. Um, And that just got extended. You know, New York had a moratorium. So it's like state to state is kind of like country to country as well, depending on the things there. So we're we are probably a bit more on the risk adverse side when it goes to leaving the United States. Like there's laws that protect businesses here that require, you know, various things to change them. Um, and so we feel a lot more comfortable. Power rates in the U S are pretty good. Uh, when you look at other countries, you're not actually seeing like these amazing opportunities. Like in the middle East, it looks like there might be some great, you know, opportunities there, but you're dealing with a, you know, sovereign wealth, entity uh, like the government is you know very much you know this person's in charge and whatever they say happens so we still see a lot of risk in some of those areas so compass is cautious um we'll we definitely are explore a handful of opportunities um and try to make sure it's right we're always going to do a lot more due diligence now than in the past to make sure we don't put client miners in a country that's going to put them at risk unknowingly or if there is a risk we're going to make sure everybody understands it yeah, great response and uh, and good detail there. Now, Shannon, I know we've covered a lot in today's uh, presentation, the first time having Compass on the channel. I wanted to throw it back to you just in case there's anything we missed or looked over that you wanted to bring up and then just thank you for your time today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything was good. I think it's a good chat to have. Uh, we've been getting back out in the media space a little more recently, as you guys have seen with our team and being a bit more public facing than we've been for a little while. So excited about that. Um, as far as compass goes, I think the biggest thing is, you know, at this point in time, we provide all of the services we need in house for third parties. And so if anybody's struggling with anything in the space, just feel free to reach out. So we got, you know, some solution for just about any issue you're dealing with. Sounds good. We'll There's make some sure great we... articles on the website to look at as well, Shannon. If everyone's got the time. <laughs> yeah. right, who, who do we know that writes Compass articles, Anthony? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. We'll, uh, we'll leave all the details to the website in the video description below. You guys, if you're interested in getting involved in self mining or any hosting, great opportunity here, especially as this bull market uh, looms in front of us. So make sure you reach out. Great opportunity. If you have any questions that we didn't address in today's video, leave them in the comment section below. If you're still watching, hit the like button. Feel free to subscribe. We'll see you back here tomorrow.